There we go, everybody. Happy Tuesday. I don't know why this is always on us. Because it looks really even to me, but it always makes me think of the old Batman show, you know, and how the villains, their hideouts were always on an angle. <laughs> no malicious intent here, folks. We've just got uh, a lot of fun stuff to share tonight. I'm not really sure what to start with. I think we're going to go with um, <laughs> the visual aid most likely to get eaten. Um, that is this right here. Uh, this is a, a pheasant mount that was uh, donated to the Nature Center by a gentleman who was moving into a retirement home. And um, I just, I, one, you know, pheasants are such beautiful creatures. I thought it was uh, share worthy. Um, two, uh, it might not be uh, a bad time to folks that this is a bird that was introduced to the States in the 1800s. Um, it was, uh, you know, as our uh, world started to get a little bit smaller, as trade routes opened up, as uh, people started learning about things that other countries had, this was uh, a bird that was was uh, uh, found in uh, uh, China and was found to be, one, very uh, nice looking, two, fun to hunt, and three, delicious to eat. So three winning qualities that caused it to be brought here to the States. Uh, first couple of introductions, this actually came, um, a lot of things, you know, came uh, from the East and moved their way West. This was actually a bird that was introduced on the West Coast, up in the Pacific Northwest. And then uh, introductions were made across the United States, uh, moving to the East. Uh, South Dakota, Montana, those remain big pheasant hunting destinations to this day. But Illinois, you know, there's a, a fair amount of uh, uh, state recreation or no, state wildlife areas that are um, managed for pheasants. Uh, there are pheasant introductions that continue there. And it's just um, an interesting bird. The other reason I wanted to bring it up was I saw one the other day. Uh, I was a little bit west of town. I was on, gosh, where was I? I was on, I want to say I was on Kesslinger, you know, west of Route 47. And um, the, the pheasant just, you know, took off. Uh, it's really kind of a, um, a sight. To, I mean, this is a big bird. Look at that tail. And it doesn't seem like they would be very aerodynamic, but boy, you know, it went, it went sailing through the air. And um, uh, was a nice reminder that we still have these birds around. Um, some people say, oh gosh, you know, I used to see a lot more pheasants than I do today. I, I think part of that is just you have to be in areas where there's still habitat for them. This is a, a grassland bird. A lot of our grasslands are subdivisions now. It seems as though where, um, you know, where the habitat still exists, uh, they're plentiful. This was a couple of years ago. I was out, um, uh, gosh, we had gone out looking for snowy owls and I was driving back. We were near the town of Creston, Illinois. Uh, there's a landfill out there, uh, Creston, uh, Cortland, that area. And there must have been, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30. Uh, it, was a, it was a good sized flock of pheasants. Um, in one of the open areas right next to the landfill. So I don't know, they, they must have been finding whatever it is, uh, the, you know, the, the foods, the seeds that it is that they need to eat. Um, wasn't a particularly scenic area, but it was something that the, uh, the pheasants found to their liking. So anyway, I got to find a place to put this. Uh, we already have some pheasants at the nature center. So I think this will become an outreach bird. I have to figure out a way <laughs> I'm open to suggestions, a way to transport this. I walked home tonight, so um, I can carry him. Okay, there's a there's actually a, a hook back here for hanging him up, um, but he doesn't, you know, doesn't really fit in a a box or anything. I'll have to figure that out uh, on my own. All right, well, let me put him down. And we'll go on to the next thing. We have, I showed you this once before when it was donated to us, but it's particularly timely this year uh, at this time 
um, as we make our way, uh, still winter, but gosh, it feels like spring out. And I have a feeling uh, spring and summer are going to come a little bit early this year. This um, opens up and transforms into an adult cicada. Now, it's an annual cicada. We can tell that by the green and brown and black coloration. But my goodness, I heard again yesterday, it was on the news again yesterday about the coming cicada apocalypse. The media just won't let this thing go. Um, they, it is an unusual year. And I, we might've already talked about this once the first time I read it, but our, um, uh, the, the, the different broods that are across the United States, the, the periodical cicadas, the 17 year cicadas can be divided up by uh, regional broods. And uh, in the Chicago area going across into um, a little bit downstate and a little bit across uh, India, the, Northern or northern part of Indiana is home to brood 13. Actually goes up into a little bit of southern Wisconsin too. Brood 13, there's a whole lot of prime numbers that are about to come. <laughs> brood 13 is coming out for its 17 year emergence this year. Now at the same time, roughly, downstate brood 19, which is a 13 year cicada brood is also going to be emerging. Uh, this hasn't happened since 1903, uh, which everybody keeps pointing out is the same year that uh, John Thomas Jefferson signed off on the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, so it's been a, a long time in coming. Um, and the way the, the media is portraying it is that there's gonna be cicadas everywhere. Well, we could only be so lucky, right? Uh, I remember in 2007, there was uh, a big, uh, a lot of hype leaning up to it. And when the day came, uh, I found one cicada, I heard one cicada calling. This is when I was working at, at Red Oak in North Aurora. I heard one cicada. I found another periodical cicada. It was dead on the ground. Uh, and that was pretty much it for Red Oak Nature Center, 28 acres of prime and, and basically, well, I shouldn't say undisturbed, but but um, you know, the, the ground there had not been dug up at all. Uh, you would think if there had been cicadas there that they would still be there, but, but there were none. The best place I found around here was around the Geneva Courthouse. So anyone who's local, if you wanna keep that in mind, I'm actually gonna, uh, I think we, we might actually hold a couple of learn from the experts classes there. They were not, those of you who are in our, our KCCN program, um, it wasn't anything in the spring newsletter, but the more I think about it, the more I think uh, we should take advantage of this once in 17 years opportunity. But this will continue um, to be in the news uh, in the uh, weeks leading up to uh, late May. I would say maybe... Well, I don't know how the, the warm weather is going to affect it. I would say probably at least by maybe the third week or fourth week in May, we'll be uh, seeing them. And then the emergence will probably last until the annual guy starts showing up, which is usually around July 1st. So the the, breed, uh, the broods don't uh, intermingle the annual cicadas. In fact, even within the brood, uh, brood 13, there are three different species, two of which are pretty common, one of which is pretty rare. But uh, even they don't, they don't in, even intermingle, even though they're, they're on a 17 year cycle. Um, they are, they have different calls, so they are not even uh, attracted to each other. So that uh, was another thing I wanted to mention. And then um, I found these, I've been picking these up. Let's see if you can get a good angle on that. It almost looks uh, like the shape of a um, uh, the, the paddle shaped seeds of an ash tree. It's a little bit different. It's got that um, fin up there on the top. 
I've been noting more and more of these on the ground when I walk beneath a certain type of tree. I'm kind of excited because I've always wanted to have one of these trees and I, I'm hoping that maybe I can get one of these seeds to grow. It's a couple of hints. Um, it's supposed to be one of the fastest growing trees in Illinois. It's also a member of the Magnolia family. They get really tall too. It's one of the taller trees that we have in this area. All right. Um, to answer this, we are going to go uh, into our slides. Wish me luck. Still have not gotten a good handle on this uh, screen sharing layout that we now have. Um, all right, let's let's pick this one. Let's see what we get. All right, well, there's the commercial. So, so far, so good. Move this window away from the shared application. Let's go here. I'm now screen sharing. That's a good thought. All right, let's go to this picture here. Do you recognize that tree? Look at the um, the flowers, which are sort of reminiscent of the magnolia. And then uh, here's a good example here of the tulip shaped leaves. This is a, a tulip tree and um, those are tulip tree seeds. I, I thought that maybe they were just um, you know, parts of the flower that had uh, dried out and were dropping to the ground, but apparently at the, at the base uh, of these fins, uh, there is a seed. So I'm gonna give it a try. I've, I've picked up several and there's, gosh, there's lots on the ground. So I can um, maybe I'll plant several and see see what we get. It might be the solution. I have a silver maple in my yard that is constantly worrying me, especially when we have uh, winds. They're, they're actually, they're starting to predict possible strong storms next week. I'm getting more and more like my dad. My dad always used to worry about the big trees in the yard, but well, maybe I'll, I'll start over again with uh, a tulip tree. We'll have to see. All right. Um, so I haven't had much of a chance to get outside lately. Uh, been spending a lot of time inside preparing for different talks. It's funny, you know, in the, the nature biz, we always used to say February is that month when we can just kind of slow down and catch our breath, um, get caught up on, on correspondence and paperwork, but it just doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Uh, I've been doing talks every single weekend of this past month. Uh, so I haven't had much of a chance to, to get out and explore, but I did yesterday. Um, I went to check on um, the nest. Remember uh, back in November, we talked about the, uh, there was a Cardinal's nest in the, uh, the area locally that's called Prairie Green. It's uh, near the Geneva Community Garden Plots on Peck Road. And there was a, a cardinal's nest there that was topped off with a whole lot of mouse had climbed up there and topped it off with a whole lot of milkweed fluff. And I'm meaning to get back over there just to see how that nest had fared over the course of the winter. So I, I stopped by yesterday and uh, the bad news is that it did not fare very well. Um, cardinals, you know, they they put their nest together with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of grasses and twigs. Uh, there's no mud or other cementing compound there to keep everything together. So I don't know if uh, if they they just kind of naturally break down or if this one was hastened along by its um, open exposure there it was the tree that it was in was right on the edge of a farm field so it would get the brunt of any uh, winds from the west or if maybe predators recognize birds nests that are covered with milkweed fluff as having delicious little mousies inside maybe you know maybe a predator climbed up there and, and knocked it down it, there was there wasn't anything left to look at so well maybe you know maybe uh I can find another mouse nest that still has milkweed fluff on top of it. I didn't, but I, I, I had just a kind of an interesting little adventure. Uh, I found this trail, if you can see here, and it's not, it's not anything that's been officially sanctioned. There's no sign pointing to it or anything. It's just a deer path 
that's uh, going between actually uh, two ag fields. You can see the, the houses over here. I think that might be um, the Fisher Farms development that would be uh, east of the garden plots. Um, but it was it was an intriguing little trail. I actually started over here and walked this way. I kept checking. Now, luckily, I don't usually wear light colored pants in the winter time. I usually wear darker colored clothing, but I did have light colored pants on yesterday. Uh, I was a little concerned walking on a deer path like that, that I might get some deer ticks. But the good news, I, I've actually had several people say that they have found ticks either on themselves or their dogs already this year. Um, I didn't get any ticks, knock on wood, that I, I have found. So so that was a good thing. Uh, and this path was was actually pretty easy to walk along. Um, I found a lot of evidence of deer brows. Uh, this is one. This is another. Can you see how um, this is not a clean nip? Uh, boy, I really thought I had that in better focus, but I guess you can see all the wrinkles in my hand, but you can't see. Um, but this is a very jagged, ragged tip. Uh, deer, or white-tailed deer, they have incisors, but only on their bottom jaw. So when they go to uh, feed on something, this looked to be a, an old goldenrod stem. When uh, the deer went to bite it off, it they they bite and then they pull and it eventually breaks off, but it's not a clean snap. Like you'd see if, uh, say, if this was lower down to the ground and a rabbit had nipped it off. Nap rabbits have, uh, they've got their incisors plus their peg teeth. So they make a very clean bite. Um, and this was, uh, this was pretty high up. I would say this piece, uh, this golden rod stem was probably three feet high where it was, was browsed off. Um, this is another plant again, um, not, not clean at all. It's it's torn and pulled. This was going all that deer path, and I thought it was it was kind of interesting. In fact, when I was walking, uh, when I was walking home last night, I was thinking about what it would be like to be able to go along and just sort of browse, graze on everything that you walked by. There, there was a lot of the signs of this. Uh, browsing behavior as I walked along the path. Can you, I know, you know, we do have, we have our grocery stores, you know, where you can walk down an aisle and you can put things in your cart. It's not quite the same though. It's just leaning over and eating as you're walking, eating and walking, walking and eating. It kind of made me a little envious of our dear friends. <laughs> um, next thing, uh, these are cockle burrs. And um there was a whole, not only were there a lot of them uh, standing, but there were a lot that were embedded in the ground. So it seems like that that field um, either wasn't tilled. It, 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 it seemed pretty open to not be in use at all. You know, it looked like it had been harvested. Um, but gosh, there were a lot of these, uh, and for about three rows in from that, uh, the path that I went to, and cockle burrs. You know, we we see the the burrs on from burdock, and then there's the the smaller the stick tights, the bidens, um, lots of little things that can get stuck on our clothing as we're walking along. But this one, this one really has some fearsome hooks. Let's see if we can zoom in here on these hooks of these seed pods. Uh, apparently the deer don't like these. I didn't see anything that had been browsed on these plants, but look at how well armed these plants are and um, able to uh, share, <laughs> hitchhike uh, their seeds, you know, let them grab onto whatever the passing creatures might be. Um, so really an impressive, they say, you know, uh, nature gives us lots of inspiration um, and this is one, you know, they say that the guy who invented, um, Velcro got his inspiration from burdock. 
I would think that this might provide some sort of inspiration as well. Um, it's uh, something you know. I was happy to uh, sidestep and move along from. I, I had a repeated notion too as I was walking along. Man, I was glad I was wearing shoes. There were so many uh, plant stems and uh, seeds like this that I uh, was really glad I had a pair of sturdy shoes on as I was walking out there. Um, and then here's here's our good old friend uh, buckthorn. There was a, a fair amount. This this particular area um, uh, was not being managed uh, that I could see at all. There were uh, there's a lot of crazy uh, shrubby willows, um, and then there was was quite a bit of buckthorn that was moving in. This is a a look at the buckthorn's buds. And somebody a, a long time ago had shown me how you can, I, this is one, one of several ways you can identify buckthorn, but um, you look at the, those buds and how they look um, pretty similar to the, uh, the hooves of a deer track. So uh, a male deer, male white-tailed deer is called a buck. And this is buckthorn. I don't think that's why the plant got the name, but see how those buds kind of look like uh, the spaced out uh, hooves of a white-tailed deer. Uh, just a little little ID trick to keep in mind. You can also uh, take a knife and and cut into not so much on these smaller stems, but on the, the trunk of the buckthorn. If you peel back the bark. Um, past the uh, the sapwood down to the heartwood, you'll see that it's orange. That's another identifier. And of course, you don't have to worry about hurting the tree because hopefully you're checking it so that you can cut it down. Um, big time invader out there. Uh, several buckthorn trees of various sizes were growing in that field. Uh, now this, this is actually uh, to the south of where I was walking, this is um, this is a lot of prairie grasses. There was a lot of Indian grass that was here. And that's a thing. I remember when um, I first started learning about restoration in the seed mixes that were being used. I, I remember uh, people always cautioning that you, you don't really want a lot of grass seed in your uh, prairie restoration mix because uh, the grasses will dominate over time if you don't have large grazing herbivores like bison to keep them in check. Uh, and that was certainly the case here. It was, it was mostly, I think this is mostly Indian grass. We zoom in. Um, oh, well, there's a, that's a plant we were going to talk about. That's a bush clover right there. But these um, ends of the uh, the tops of the grasses here, uh, there's not too many seeds left. Uh, luckily, you know the birds will will feed on some of them. But uh, Indian grass doesn't get the um, the seed heads don't have the uh, little what I like to call fingers uh, of the big blue stem or state grass. Uh, that uh, the seed head on big blue stem will have in fact the nickname for big blue is uh, the turkey foot grass because that's the shape of the seed head on that this is all um, pretty straight up Indian grass just has seeds on a single stem but there there were a few other things like this bush clover uh, in fact I think I did a zoom yeah here's a, a closer up look at the uh, the bush clover. This is a, a plant that's really popular with winter birds. You'll see uh, finches and sparrows uh, feeding on this plant. Um, I did try to disperse some of those seeds after I took the picture in hopes of encouraging a little bit more bush clover and maybe a little bit less of the grasses in the coming growing season. I don't know, we'll have to see, see what happens next. And then I love, I love a shrub. So I, I struggle. I've always struggled with shrub ID. I've never really uh, found a, a good course to take. Uh, there's so many shrubs, but every once in a while, there's a, there's a gimme that comes along. And that's this one here, those bright red um, shoots there. 
that's a uh, red osier dogwood. Um, I can see the red stems. Now there's no, uh, there's no thorns or anything on this dogwood. Sometimes you see red canes growing, particularly uh, woodland edges. That would be our, um, our uh, ras the bra raspberry brambles that we have around here. But red osier dogwood, it's a, it's a nice native plant. It makes a, a nice little spot of color. Not really something you want in your prairie, but this was on the edge. So um, a, uh, a welcome change from the buckthorn that I was seeing over uh, on the other side of this field. Um, and then there was quite a bit of this. This is a nice uh, grass to see as well. This is Canada rye. It's got all these twisty, uh, mm -hmm. turny types of seeds at the top of the seed head. Um, trying to photograph, it was it was kind of breezy yesterday and trying to, to uh, focus on leaves, uh, uh, sheaths of this grass that were flopping back and forth combined with my poor photography skills, uh, didn't really uh, get a lot of success there, but this one had flopped over on the uh, dogwood. So we got a twofer here. We've got our red red twig dogwood and our, uh, our Canada rye together here. And then here I, I tried to show our, um, this is a dog bane. Let me see if we can focus in here. Yeah, it didn't turn out so well. But there was there was a lot of other fluff, uh, and it got me to thinking. I wondered if uh, if any animals would gather. I would imagine that the floss from dogbane could be uh, used in a similar fashion as the floss or the fluff from milkweed. But then when I when I started holding it, I realized it was it was much finer, and I, I I'm wondering if it maybe doesn't have the same qualities as. Um, milkweed. It reminded me, uh, Diane, I don't know if you're on tonight, but it reminded me of uh, when you said that even though this is a plant with milky sap, it's not a host for um, monarch butterflies. So it's sort of a um, separate, uh, it's, it's not even related to milkweed, but the qualities that it has that make it seem similar to milkweed, um, it, it's really got some uh, some noticeable differences when you start looking at it very close. Um, the fine character, you can, yeah, that's not really gonna tell us much there. Um, but even the seeds that are attached to that floss are, they're almost like little needles. They're very small. Um, so I don't know if they would uh, hold much in the way of um, uh, nutrition if anything tried to eat it either. But they're pretty pretty good stand. Dog bane, once it gets started in an area, it will spread. Um, another name for dog bane is Indian hemp, which is um, uh, due to the fibrous nature of, here we can see, this is the tops of the, uh, the dog bane here. Here's the, these are the pods in these areas. Um, the, uh, the stems have, uh, these long strands of fiber that can be stripped away. And uh, if you wet them and braid them, they can make a, a pretty strong cord. That uh, was something that was valued by uh, Native Americans and early settlers. So, so it does have some uses in that respect. I don't know that it was used, uh, though, um, for much else but good stand of dog bane started there and it'll probably continue to spread because that's what dog bane does <laughs> uh, and then i found these i i love the look of this plant these little seed heads uh this is this is um uh, bee balm monarda uh it's a uh, pioneer prairie plant and it's <laughs> It's got a lot of pioneering left to do. It's it's a plant that that gains hold easily, and can grow uh, and spread fairly rapidly. Uh, it's really popular with our pollinators in the summertime, and then uh, in the winter, you know, once it's done blooming, those flowers all turn to seeds, and each one of these little tubes has seeds inside. Uh, I shook one out here 
you can see just how small these seeds are probably is one reason why um, they can uh, form uh, a monoculture pretty quickly. There's a ton of seeds in each one of those seed heads. And if even half of them uh, land on the ground and start to grow, uh, we're going to get a lot more uh, Monarda plants growing there. But it's uh, that's not a bad thing. Uh, it's a it's a plant that boy I've seen. Um, of course, it's very popular with our uh, bumblebees, uh, but I've also seen uh, tiger swallowtails and monarchs nectaring there. Those um, the clear wing moths, the ones that some people call them. There's, well, there's hummingbird moths, there's bumblebee clear wings, but those uh, little moths that look kind of like other creatures like hummingbirds, like bumblebees. They love the nectar, super popular with a lot of pollinators. I was glad to see that there is a start of that too coming in. Um, then you know, there's um, this plant, which as far as introduced species go, um, there's some that are a lot worse, uh, bring a lot worse things to the table than this one. You might recognize the seed head here. They commonly will form what's called a bird's nest, this formation here. This is uh, Queen Anne's lace. Uh, the, the reason I, I it, and it, it, it will dominate as well. In fact, if we look at its seed heads, look at all of those seeds uh, inside of Queen Anne's lace. If you've ever planted carrots, um, you might notice a similarity to the seeds that are shown here. Um, but these are uh, very prolific seeders, so they they can uh, take over as well. This this plant was right next to the Monarda, so it'll be interesting to see in the future uh, which seeds are hardiest and which uh, which uh, plants went out. This was uh, all along uh, uh, the the a path leading back to the parking lot of that area. Uh, but one somewhat redeeming quality for Queen Anne's lace is the fact that it is a host plant for our uh, black swallowtails. It's a, a member of the, the carrot family and that's what black swallowtails feed on. So um, I do always in the summertime like to look carefully as we're pulling Queen Anne's lace from an area. I always like to look carefully on the uh, the stems to see, make sure we're not removing any uh, caterpillars along with uh, the plants. But really impressed. Look at all of those seeds in there. Cool looking stuff, even if it is introduced. <laughs> Um, and then, so then I went over, um, and you can see how how uh, glaring the sun was. This was probably I don't know four thirty in the afternoon. And I was a little um, heartened by the fact that um, Geneva Garden, uh, the Geneva Park District's garden plots have the same issues the St. Charles Park District garden plots have. Um, they they're doing a really nice job here of uh, sectioning off different areas for compost. Uh, this is all looked like it was coming along really nicely. There's a lot of, um, uh, this was leaf compost here. And then over here, as the sign says, this was um, garden plot generated landscape waste. And of course, people, you know, <laughs> they see a place to dump stuff, they dump stuff. So there's a outlet cover in here. There were There was a lot of uh, items that I suspect were not from the garden plots. But what was really interesting and what I didn't get a good picture of was the number of birds that were going um, not just to, they, they, they kind of avoided the garden plot waste, but they went, um, they were poking around in these leaves. And then there was yet another bin uh, to the east of the leaf uh, bin. And, and these, these were huge piles, by the way. These piles, if I stood next to them, were probably, uh, six feet high, uh, so so big, big piles. Um, but there were there were a lot of uh, birds, there were a lot of robins foraging. Um, so there must be a, a healthy insect life in uh, in these piles too. And when you've got birds, you've got predators of birds. I'm pretty sure these are cat tracks. Uh, 
when we look at them, let's let's zoom in a little bit. So we've got our one, two, three, four toes, and one toe is a little bit ahead. This would be the right foot um, because this toe is ahead of this toe here. Um, cat tracks, they've got the same number of toes as a dog, but then the heel is in a different configuration. I was wishing the cat had come down just a little bit harder on its heel so we could see what the lobes look like back here. Um, given the location and the size of these tracks, I'm pretty sure this was uh, just a, not, well, yeah, just, just a stray cat. I don't think this was a bobcat. I don't think they were quite big enough for that. Um, plus this is a pretty uh, exposed and public location. But one, two, three, four toes, uh, an absence of claws. Now, sometimes you can see uh, the claws or the nails of a cat if the uh, substrate is is um, not just deep, but also slippery. The, the cat will stick those claws out there to get some traction, but apparently this kitty didn't feel the need to do that. Um, and I couldn't find any more tracks beyond this. I think it jumped off of that pile of compost and then went on its way. So uh, popular with those types of predators too. And these types of predators. Now this um, is a scat that was really impressive. When we're teaching tracking classes and we talk about the twisting, turning nature of canine digestive systems, uh, sometimes, especially on, on fresher scats that have um, fewer uh, fur components in them, it can be hard to see the twist, but this one was just twisting and turning all over. And to really appreciate the size, you need something like a lip balm next to it. So two and five eighths inches there. Uh, this scat was probably at least uh, five inches or more in length. And then um, you know, twisting and turning. It's quite old too. Whatever uh, other matter was in this scat has, has worn away and we're really left with just the fur and um, a few little bones sticking out there too. But this was maybe six feet or so from those cat tracks. Unrelated though, um, cats definitely don't make twisty turny scat like that. All right, uh, from here, um, oh, no, there was one more. This, this kind of made me laugh too. Yet another thing, um, sharing a, a little bit of kinship with our friends in Geneva. We find this uh, too at the St. Charles Garden Platts. People uh, they lose stuff, they forget things. And then when our uh, our teams go in to plow the field, uh, plow these plots up to get them ready for uh, the next season, uh, they find all kinds of things. And this one looks, uh, this is a hoe that I think maybe was found after the tractor ran over it. Um, it can be kind of dangerous sometimes for our guys. You know, if there's uh, uh, implements that are left out there that are, are metal and, and sharp and unseen can uh, add a little bit of danger to the uh, the garden maintenance tasks that they face. All right, so here, Laura, this uh, these are uh, actually from today. And it, it's funny, you, you sent these pictures in and I had just been talking with our marketing manager. She had had uh, a phone call into our uh, restoration ecologist uh, team leader, Ryan. She had some questions for him about a project we're working on. She said, you know, he's not answering his phone. And I said, boy, you know, it's a perfect day for burning. Um, I had seen some columns of smoke yesterday when I was out, uh, but I, I hadn't noticed any today, but boy, <laughs> I just wasn't looking in the right direction. This is Hickory Knolls uh, taken, uh, I'd imagine from our first uh, what I call the first bump. Um, I think the uh, restoration team calls it the knob, but this is a, a little came and this is looking down towards, there's the nature center there. Are you on tonight, Laura? Yeah, I just got <coughs> a tickle. Yeah, sorry. Of course. <laughs> my throat. Here, I'll of drink course. some tea for you. <laughs> <laughs> I need some tea. I'm drinking wine. That's probably the problem. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll <trade> you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, no, um, I came in to, um, uh, we have um, uh, the Nature Play School. Oh, sure. We, we had planned to spend most of the day outside from 1230 to three. Mm -hmm. And um, had been assured uh, when I got there, when I saw some smoke in the distance that, oh, don't worry, it's not going to be close. <laughs> and I went in and told uh, other staff, well, it's at the pavilion, it's moving to the road, and they're burning the whole prairie. So You can't really get much closer than that. Actually. No, no, <laughs> you, you can't. But um, so we, we uh, kept the kids inside for a, a while, just um, not that it would be a danger to them because we're so close to the building, but I don't think they would pay much attention to us when there's flames and, and people and smoke. <laughs> But uh, I took this afterwards, um, and this is at the top of the came, and it's just such a cool, uh, you know, it's almost like a moonscape. Yeah. You know, at the top of the came, and then you can see, you know, the trail. I never even realized walking that trail how twisty it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. I've always thought of it as fairly straight, but. Right. Um, and it's so cool. Um, you know, the. Cool things and and sad things along the um road that goes to the boys' home. There you uh, you, you could see how many bottles and cans uh, were alongside there. But um, I, yeah, I talked to Kate today and she goes, "Oh, we've got to go out there um, and traipse around because you know if you remember uh, at um uh last oh, time the fen? But, yeah at the fen if you go out there, I mean it's a great time to find." bones yeah Ooh, so um kate and i might have to make an excursion out there <laughs> well that's Saturday. that's so true laura in fact um there were uh, uh on so on the south side of the came so over here towards the boys home yeah this was a few years ago there was not one but two uh mink skeletons oh up there. gotcha and um and then uh we'll be doing our um uh, kcc and geology field trip there in april so uh, usually when they burn um it's in march and yeah. the grasses haven't really started to come with with the kind of winter we're having we might have you know six inches of grass up by the time we're there in I, april. you know i wouldn't doubt it you know it's <laughs> But it it does it does give you a unique uh, perspective on what's out there. Um, one of uh, my favorite nature nerdy hobbies will be uh, visiting the uh, ant hills that are out here. To oh, look for flicker scat, flickers uh, will eat ants. That's their preferred food. They'll they'll eat ants over anything else. And when the ground gets uh, uh, bared like this when uh, the grasses are all down it's easy pickings for them to find those giant ant hills that are out here in the sandy gravelly areas mm -hmm. and um, the flicker scat is um, it's usually coated with a little bit of white urates but then you break it open it's all sparkly almost looks like little bits of gold but it's the sparkly exoskeletons of the ants so, I I think that sounds like a nature nerd walk. It's, it's a hardcore nature nerd thing. But <laughs> oh, it something I always think about when we see the uh, the burns that have happened. But yeah, that's a great point about this curvy trail because it really does feel like you're walking straight. Yeah, yeah. To the came interesting stuff, and it makes a nice fire break too. You know, um, yeah. When 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 our so when our crew burns, the, this is all. Uh, there's there's, uh, you know a lot of preparation that goes in day of they they can't start too early in the morning because there's usually frost or dew that has to burn off um, and they have to make sure the wind is from the proper direction and it's not too strong so the fire doesn't get away from them and there's there's lots and lots of things and then um, the other part of the planning is um, selecting the units to burn our, all of our natural areas are divided up into burn units and you, you can't it's not recommended that you burn the same unit every year because you want um, things. Uh, there's there's a thing is too much burning that can happen. 
So um, I can't remember if it was three years ago that they burned this. I bet Ryan would know. Um, but it's uh, it's really a sight to see. And this isn't the only picture you sent. I think I uploaded a couple more here. Um, yeah. There's... Uh, so this is up on the uh, the next hill, right? Yes, one of the big oak trees back there. Uh, again, the 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 reason that these burns occur is to uh, one knock back some of the invasive plants that aren't adapted to fire. Pretty much everything that grows here in northern Illinois is adapted to having fire push through at one time or another. They have long roots in the ground, so uh, they'll just you know, start to grow fresh, that what's burning off on top is just the, the duff or the, the dead part of the plant. So um, that uh, will hasten uh, return of nutrients to the soil, knock back some of the invasives and um, help, uh, help keep that land uh, getting healthier and healthier. Now I did laugh at this. This one looks like this is... Uh, <laughs> A burner, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is the one at the end of, well, or you could say at the beginning of Carol's wetland. Okay. Uh, you know, right by, real close to the drive, uh, to the entrance to the boys' home. And, yeah. The, you and, know, snakes like to hang out under there. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bad day for them then. <laughs> <laughs> When well, I if, first you know, started taking, I, when I went over there, I didn't want to get in trouble. You know, there was some somebody watching, you know, keeping an eye on things. But it was actually still a little flaming. Oh. Um, but uh, not much, not much at all. But uh, Chris had said, well, everything is, you know, burned around it. So yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a saying, and I can't remember. It's, it's a catchy little saying, but you like black black on black or black doesn't burn or something like that. As long as there's that, that healthy margin of black around it. Yeah. It yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I hope it doesn't burn all the way away because it is a, it's a, a handy place to check for things like snakes when you've got a group of kids out um, on a hike. Yeah, during and it's a, a huge, huge log. Too. It is. It is big. And it's been there a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, the other neat thing was, um, as I was walking in the direction toward the log and going by Carol's wetlands, I'm always trying when we take field trip kids, you know, out there and saying, okay, here's the wetlands. Well, and talking about it, you can't see the water because mm. the vegetation is too high. And it was so neat to, to see the little uh kind of like mini little ponds and puddly mm -hmm. areas by the willows and for you know um and I'm, and I'm like yeah there I had to convince myself yes there is really water out there, <laughs> <laughs> there because really you can't see it. <laughs> well you know I, I have a feeling that back you know before European settlement settlement I think that our whole park complex was a wetland because there's there's miles and miles of drain tiles out underneath the soccer fields. And there's oh. a drain uh, somewhere. Let's see, there's the mailbox. I think the drain somewhere over here where water shoots um, underneath the road um, okay. and collects uh, over on the nature center side. So it, it can get pretty wet over there too. Yeah. And then it, it, all, it just kind of keeps sloping downward towards uh, Peck Road over there. And I, I really think it was probably wet all over there. When, it, when in fact, um, these oaks back here, um, which are across the road, um, there were some uh, soil cores that were pulled after we built Hickory Knolls and they all came up dark, like wetland soil. Oh. So I, I think this is, What's left is over here. We call Carol's wetland, but I really think it's a, a small remnant of what used to be a much larger wetland complex. Uh, Who knows? There might even be some mastodons mired out there. <laughs> Just we we can find those too. <laughs> <laughs> How cool would that be? That'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, all right. I think we're, we're at the end floor. Thanks so much for, for bringing us up to date on that. I'm going to stop.
just share. And then we had we had one more. Um, and Diane, I think you're, are you on tonight? I saw your name somewhere, uh, but I don't remember if it was in the emails or if it was in this. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna try and do another screen share to show the video that you shared. Um, and I, I did not have good luck doing this last week. So let's see if we can share, share, share. All right, let's try this. Um, it says screen share is loading. Um, participants can now see your application. All right, so we're going to watch a little video that Diane made um, for better or for worse. <laughs> you have a new tenant, huh? <laughs> So I, I was in the I was in the family room and I heard um, knocking <laughs> like peck, peck, peck. And I knew it was a bird, but I looked out, you know, I looked out the window. I couldn't see anything. So then I went around um, and looked in through another window and I saw this going on. I couldn't believe it. So gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. <laughs> the chickadee is moving in, I think. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... Um... I remember uh, I was at uh, I was at my brother's house for a Mother's Day cookout. This was several years ago, and there was a chickadee uh, excavating a a nest in uh, a it was a crab apple tree outside of their kitchen window. And I thought it was so interesting how the bird had found uh, just the right place. It was where a, a branch had been trimmed years ago, but that was May. <laughs> And this is February. So my 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 gut is saying that it's excavating for a nest, but it seems awfully early. Um, this <laughs> is a bird that that will will take shelter in a cavity in the winter time too. Um, but you know, maybe I, I did hear a, a spring song the other day that two note that um that song. I don't know if you've been hearing anything like that uh, around your house, if that would indicate that they're already in the breeding mode yeah I, ha I haven't noticed that um but yeah it so i um it, this also reminded me i had some friends that um uh lived in a, in a relatively new house they built it in the 1980s and um they uh found a, a chickadee uh excavating one of the columns on the front of their house and uh it ended up it raised its young in there and then after the chickadee left they replaced the wood i think they they got those sheaths to put over the columns so that they wouldn't be um the, the wood surface wasn't exposed anymore but yeah i don't know what do you think you're gonna do diane you're gonna let the the chickadee family uh oh, oh definitely <laughs> <laughs> but um but I, the good news is it's in the back of the house. So uh -huh. it's not like it's that visible, but um, I just was so surprised because I, I expected it would be a woodpecker or, yeah. and then I looked and I saw this cute little chickadee and I thought, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that something? Well, they, they, they do make use of cavities and if they find a spot, I almost wonder if maybe there was a little bit of uh, some softer wood there. It looks like it, made some test bores here and then found a spot to its liking, but they, they will excavate in an area that they feel they can um, make use of. I, I had this happen with a downy woodpecker on the South side of my house. Um, oh gosh, when was that? And I, um, I didn't seal it up after uh, the, the downy raised its brood. Um, they all fledged, they left. I didn't get on it quick enough and then starlings moved in. So oh, I guess no. that, would, that would be my advice is that if the okay. chickadees are done, <laughs> once the cute little chickadees leave, uh, make sure you, you don't let starlings get in there next. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the info. <laughs> oh, thanks for the video. Very cute little birds. <laughs> All right. Well, that, um, that share went relatively painlessly. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop that now. We've got, looks like we've got some, uh, some comments here to get to before we call it a night. 
Uh, so yeah, let's do an LFB and Cicada. So, so yeah, um, those of you who are in, uh, the KCCN program, uh, I, on this past Saturday, I presented with our, our old pal Valerie at, um, the, uh, WPPC wildflower propagation and preservation or preservation and propagation committee up in McHenry County. We did a a talk on cicadas and as we were driving home this was up at um mchenry county college as we were driving home we thought gee you know if we're doing it for other counties we should be doing it for kane too uh so i we talked uh, and it's still kind of coming together but what i'd like to do is an all outdoor program by the geneva courthouse because that was the the, the largest um uh, a number of cicadas were seen in that area in 2007. Cicadas, you know, they're the kind of thing, they're um, they're a, a, a bulky insect. They do have wings, but they're not, they're not great at flying. They can, you know, go short distances. But if, if an area did not have periodical cicadas in 2007, it's pretty unlikely that um, any part of that brood uh, would have made it very far away to start a new area. Uh, and I don't think anybody was working on doing cicada introductions anywhere. So um, uh, yeah, well, so we'll, we'll work on that. It'll be probably late May or very, very early June. We'll do that. Um, ah, good guess, coffee tree, tulip tree. Yep, that's what it was. Um, and I will let you know if uh if i get any of these seeds to start um cicadas in the fall uh, uh fabian and redant oh okay um uh well uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind melissa and then uh, k's all in on the lfe and um Oh, you know what? I, I saw that cicada backpack too, Diane. It it actually it looked it looked a lot like this. It was just bigger. Um, it was bigger and it had straps. And in, instead of um another cicada inside, it was it was a backpack. It did look kind of creepy, but but in a in a very nerdy kind of a way. It might be something you want to consider for your uh, ramblings around. <laughs> When you uh, uh, pulled that out this evening, I thought that's what that was. I thought it was the backpack, and then it, it, it uh, the looks, same backpack that I that I received today from my my oldest son. <laughs> we thought, thought that I might be interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? It's a statement. It's a fashion statement. <laughs> uh, and then you, you said you you did some reading on dog uh, dog bean seed pods, longer, more slender than milkweed, usually in pairs. Um, yeah, dog bane, it was it was useful. I remember um learning the term Indian hemp to describe the dog bane plant because of the strong the strength of the fibers of that plant. Uh and we've got a question from Meredith. What happens to anthills during burns? You know, it so the burns, that's something I, I wanted to mention too. So timing is everything with burns, not just with uh the present weather conditions, but um, also in the, the larger scheme of things, getting things burned uh, before um, the, the uh, amphibians are out, before our, our frogs start to call, uh, before our snakes start coming up from their hibernaculums. The ants, um, so the vegetation, the, the anthills will be in amongst all of uh, the prairie vegetation. Um, they're going to be down inside a day like this they they might be starting to move around a little bit but the heat uh, from the flames they uh, will drive them back down into their hole um the the hill itself is pretty stable it's made out of um all the the soil and the sand that they've excavated so uh it, it's fun though to to go so now now that that area has been burned it'll be fun to go and see um you can see the holes that um, the birds make by poking in, and then you can see the holes the ants make. When they come out, there'll be little tunnels around them where they've pushed soil out of the way so that they can emerge. 
So it's it's a whole fun thing that it's really hard to do when there's a lot of prairie plants surrounding them. But when it's bare like that, it's it's fun to spot them and, and go check them out. Um, yeah, sad to see the bunnies after these burns. Bunnies, uh, sometimes voles. The, so the, when an area like this is burned, there is going to be um, some loss of life. I remember this was really early in um, my uh, naturalist career. I was still uh, working. I was working at Red Oak. We had a really small area there. It's still there. It's called the Blue Sky Prairie. It's It's actually the the front yard of a house that is no longer there. When when the house was torn down, what was turf grass was turned into uh, prairie. Well, um, we would burn that little patch and invariably uh, you'd see birds of prey coming there attracted to those columns of smoke so that they uh, might have a chance of catching uh, a meal that is either trying to get out of there or maybe has sustained injury as a part of the fire. So, um, there, there is probably, uh, you know, voles and a few other things like that, that um, did not survive, but it does help uh, the other, the higher up rungs of the food chain. In fact, I told our park safety guy tonight, he'd come to the office while I was still there and he, he had noted that we'd had a burn and he said, yeah, the coyotes aren't going to have a place to hide anymore. I said, well, not for a few weeks anyway, but I think they will be uh, finding plenty to eat while there. I told him to, to check later on to see if he could see any of them prowling around out there, uh, sniffing and looking for some toasted voles or uh, other things like that. Um, and I think that's it. I think we're down to the bottom and we're, uh, we're at nine o'clock too. So um, folks, that's what I had. Uh, if nobody else, I don't know, does anybody else have anything? If not, um, yeah, that doesn't make it any better. I will see for uh, next. Oh, next time, we are not meeting next week. Our next, um, our next good natured will not be uh, next week. The next time we'll be here is in March, the first Tuesday in March. So take next week off. Uh, go get yourself some good nature, and um, we'll reconvene uh, that first Tuesday in March. Thanks, everybody another great chat uh see y'all again in two weeks thank you thank you pam bye-bye thanks pam. Pam. Thanks, pam. Thanks, pam. Thanks, pam. Thanks, pam thanks pam thanks pam